we're just going to talk a bit about the University of Hertfordshire's Heritage Hub. And we've thought of this a bit like a conversation. So there are some bits that we will take it in turns to talk about. And then at various points, we will chip in um, to what one another is saying. And we're hoping that at the end, that we, we're really very interested to hear what people here's experiences have been. And we flagged some issues that we found sort of thought provoking, um, potentially troubling. And we'd be again very interested to hear what, what people think about those or whether there are other issues that this raises. Um, the University of Hertfordshire set up a multidisciplinary heritage hub. Um, and as a historian, I ought to know this, but it was somewhere in 2010 and 20, to, towards 2010 and 2011. Um, I'll come on in a minute and tell you exactly what this thing is and what it does. But the immediate catalyst for us was a local heritage organisation in Hertfordshire, which for many months um, in well, 2009 and 2010, tried to get university interest in and resources to establish a heritage centre. And the group's leader worked his way around various departments on two campuses. Um, he went to geography, outposts of the vice chancellor's office, humanities, creative arts, the university's arts centre, the Centre for Sustainable Communities, and probably more areas. Those are the ones I know he definitely went to. And it was only accidentally in the course of a conversation between two historians and a geographer that we discovered that we'd all experienced what was effectively the same meeting, and we had all said the same things at that meeting. And what we said was that as academics, we were interested in the local area, but that the university was not awash with cash to fund large-scale initiatives or indeed medium or small-scale initiatives. And it was that glimpse of this assiduous outsider negotiating the complexities of university structures, the conviction that somewhere there must be money, and university insiders' total ignorance of what was going on even along the corridor in a different subject area that persuaded us that we needed some sort of mechanism to address the problem of university communication. And this is why we established this thing called the Heritage Hub. It was to sort of address that sort of situation. The first thing we, we wanted it to do was to offer a place of first resort for those outside the university who wanted to contact researchers inside the university who were interested in history and heritage. There was no obvious place for people to find, to sort of contact, make contact. And connected with that, we wanted to provide a sort of more unified and more outward facing identity for university heritage engagement um, activities. We also wanted to explain much more clearly what it is that the university does and doesn't do. And in this way, try and avoid some of those issues of duplication and wastage, um, freeing up everyone to explore what was possible to do rather than going round and round on the things that really weren't going to, going to happen. We also wanted to bring together academic researchers with an interest in any form of history or heritage from across the university. In the same way that the, the local heritage group tried to find somebody in the university to, who would support them and help them, um, we discovered through that process, actually it was then the, it was actually the heritage group that then told, when, when they told me who, all the people that they'd contacted, we realised that there were parts of the university working on issues around heritage that we didn't know about. Um, and people doing really interesting projects, but in other, in other subject areas. So we thought it would be quite inter would be very interesting if we could find a way um, to work together, to work across disciplines, to pool expertise from um, subject areas as wide as um, education, history, law, business, geography, geography and urban planning, engineering, and so forth. And then we thought that if we, if we could find a way of sort of trying to get our own house in order, I suppose, then we would actually be in a better place to reach out to local communities, housing associations, archive and library services, um, conservation charities, <laughs> district and county councils, education and outreach organisations, um, heritage trusts, co companies operating in the Heritage Centre, tourism, um, and there are other on my list, which I probably haven't mentioned, but we, it, we thought that actually we needed, we, need, we needed more resources in a sense if we were going to actually reach out more consistently in this area. 
And then a, f a, f a final but probably not exhaustive um, point to make is that we also were increasingly aware, and this is where the Heritage Hub sort of intersected with university dynamics and, and pressures, um, is that in history we were very interested in finding ways for students to participate in local history projects as volunteers. And we thought that this would actually again be a way of, of um, exploring what the opportunities might be, often in places which we might not have thought of as the obvious. So it's relatively straightforward to think about students volunteering in terms of a local museum or archive. But actually, when you're thinking about the local group down the road um, and their project that perhaps is linked to a, a residence association, how does one sort of think about the opportunities and, 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 and the benefits of, for, for both parties, or many parties on that side? So, that, that, so the Heritage Hub is a virtual thing, I suppose we would say, in that it doesn't have a building or a place. People do meet face to face. Um, but it's really a network of um, people across the university from all these, and all, it, it has, it's whatever people think is heritage, which is also very interesting for people like me in history, as to what people think of is a historical interest or some element of the past that is being used in the present. So that, 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 that is a sort of summary of what the Heritage Hub does and why we set it up. Right. Um. So we were aware there was lots of activity going on quite nicely um, in the region without our involvement. So the next challenge for us was to reach out of the university to see what was going on out there. Um, and the approaching centenary of the First World War seemed a promising hook. So in June 2011, we held what became the first of a series of remembering the First World War events, inviting local groups and individuals onto the campus to share their research and their interest in the subject. About 90 people turned up to that first event, so we had stalls, uh, soap boxes allowing people to stand up and give a three-minute talk about what they were doing, um, a talking wall where people could put post-it notes up saying what they were interested in, and um, uh, the killer thing was we had a very, very good tea, which uh, people still talk about the cake that we served on that day. We've never managed to quite repeat the standard, but, uh, but uh, it certainly drew people in. And what we had stumbled upon, really, was a huge amount of enthusiasm and goodwill, including impressive expertise about the county and its historical resources. So we began to forge relationships with groups, gaining a better understanding of their dynamics and their dilemmas. Um, so since those first thoughts, we've, um, act activity has really multiplied. Um, so the first thing we did was to set up a website, which I'm hoping this is going Done. to work. Okay. So this is the Heritage Hub um, website. Um, this was not without problems. Anybody else who's had dealings with setting up websites has probably come across similar things, uh, and we're going to talk about that a bit later. Um, but we wanted it to be, rather than setting up, which we could have done quite easily, set up an independent site, we wanted a, a University of Hertfordshire site because that sort of reinforced that cross-departmental um, cooperation. Um, so the website um, now provides a point of connection and it's a doorway into the university. Um, it's been through various re revisions along the way and that's all a case of responding to what people have told us is missing or not working. Um, People wanted, they told us they wanted somewhere to publicise their own events and their news. So we came up with, we added tabs here, um, so just gives you a flavour. Um, and they also wanted links to their own websites, which we were able to provide. But also we were able to flag up some free resources. Uh, one of the problems anybody who's dealt with community groups knows is that they have this problem because a lot of what we deal with as academics is licensed and they have, they have trouble. So we felt it sort of incumbent upon us to flag up as much as we could that was freely accessible. So um, we have set this up. This is definitely work in progress. Um, but as you can see, we've got links to local history societies, um, specialist history groups across the county, just community websites, and then just various projects as people. These headings change as people say something and it doesn't fit, so we have to, we have to shuffle it all around. Um, museums, and then just a sort of range of websites that people may not have been aware of, um, and resources, that sort of thing. Um, so that, that's the website, and it's very much work in progress. 
So, um, in 2011, like a lot of people, we applied to the HRC for the Connected Communities All Our Stories funding um, to work with local groups on community heritage. And our Heritage Hub team includes academics from history, creative writing, creative arts, tourism and media. Um, and what that funding allowed us to do was sort of accelerate what we had been doing. But it also flagged up issues of sustainability, which again, we'll come back to at the end. Um, the hub is all about links. Uh, what we hadn't anticipated were the links that were made across the hub, uh, but not mediated by us. So several local groups, uh, particularly those interested in First World War history, um, formed from connections made um, via meeting at our events. Um, and, and this actually, we've been quite cheered by this. It's a, it's a, it, offers, um, it offers a model of growth in confidence, but other ways of doing history for local groups. Well, that's, that's been a real plus point. Um, last year we ran a, well, earlier this year we ran a small match funding scheme for community groups. That was meant to reach people we hadn't re reached before, sort of not, not your typical local history society. Uh, we had some success with that. We managed to, um, uh, there was, we funded a, a small arts group who did a mural which was then publicly displayed in, in a local town centre. We worked with Elstree um, Screen film screen heritage? Screen. Screen heritage. <laughs> um, who were trying to mark an anniversary of um, television making in Elstree in uh, South Hertfordshire by developing an app. Uh, we worked with um, St Peter's Church in St Albans, which is one of these very old churches, which was really trying to connect with the people out in the, in the town. So they're developing uh, a series of trail leaflets. Um, I've missed... The gazebos. The gazebos. My favourite is the gazebos. This is a... Uh, a group in Ware, which is on the River Lee, and these lovely gazebos um, are sort of summer residences that people would come out from London in the 18th and into the 19th century to get away from the, the noxious smells. And these gazebos were built across the river. Um, some of these have now been preserved, and what we were able to do was give them additional funding to support um, uh, interpretation boards. So these weren't and the huge. scouts. Oh, and the scouts. scouts. Yes, the scouts. The county scouts. How could I forget? Like, we were able to help them um, develop. They, they looked at the history. There's this 105 years history, and we were able to help them develop a CD-ROM, which they could then distribute freely to um, scout groups across the county. The, the amounts of money weren't large, but they were they were significant. And as I say, we met, managed to reach people we hadn't reached before, which was which was something we were really pleased about. Uh, so that's that's the match funding, and then I the other, one of the other things we do is we run an equipment lending scheme. So that's largely things like um, digital recorders, a projector that's surprisingly popular that one, um, and video booths. So the things you can stand up and b with button, uh, questions on the screen and people press the button and speak, um, and you can use them in sort of community settings and so on. Um, we did that partly because we were aware that the university potentially had resources that smaller groups couldn't afford um, to buy for themselves. And we also did it as we increasingly became aware too that um, a lot of people apply for funding for equipment and then when the project's over it's a bit uncertain where, where, these, bit, where these bits and pieces end up. So at the end of a, at the end of a project it can be um, that a local group no longer has access to those pieces of equipment and so we can, we can lend them out. And in fact we're now trying to encourage people that you know, they don't necessarily have to buy them, they could actually just borrow them from us. Um, and related to that, um, the university is also setting up um, an online or digital oral history repository because the other thing we've become aware of is that there are so across, it must be the same everywhere, across the county there are boxes and boxes of cassette tapes of really interesting oral history recordings from projects dating back decades and nobody knows what's on them, nobody knows how to play them anymore um, and the, again there's the risk of either losing stuff or just repeating, going, duplicating effort that doesn't need, need to happen. So we're hoping to be able to set, set this up, launch that next year. So again it would be a, a, a publicly accessible place where people can actually leave, leave their stuff knowing that it's going to be maintained um, and also make those um, recordings available to a much wider audience than has been possible before. Um, the final thing to mention about the Heritage Hub now is something that actually, again, is not necessarily what we set out to do, but has sort of emerged over the last couple of years. And that is a 
so this is a, a university focused thing and that is the because the hub is multidisciplinary we've actually now set up a professional doctorate scheme and the idea with that is that people could come and study and they can actually choose which disciplines and which subject areas they they want to combine so you can have a com people working on um, on projects which might combine education and history or creative arts and education or engineering and media or something like that again the common denominator is simply it has to involve the past in some form have some interest in the past in time um, so that also for the university that became feasible only really because of the heritage hub i don't think we could have done it if we hadn't started to build up this network of connections across the university as well as across across the university and sort of trying to break down those boundaries between the institution and that sort of wider community that we sit in. Um, yeah, so over the last few years, Sarah and I have encountered a vibrant world of local history projects, which have led us to topics we'd never have considered otherwise. Uh, while their sheer variety has made us rethink our understandings of what history means and how it is made. So, for example, we've worked with Stevenage Football Club, collecting oral histories of... Um, um, fans and uh, their experiences of the club over the years. Uh, the Scout Troop, we mentioned. Um, Apsi Paper Trail is a museum dedicated to the paper industry, which was uh, Hertfordshire has a reputation as a very rural county, but West Hearts um, had a very, very strong uh, paper industry, now down to just one small mill that is left. Um, and they're very keen at Apsi to recover that story. Um, we've worked with um, some learning disability activists. Again, Hertfordshire has a history of um, asylums um, in the south of the county, um, housing people who were coming out from London, um, and we've been able to work with um, some of those, and that's work in progress at the moment. Um, a village residence association, which is Smallford, which was one of the All Our Stories projects, um, they're looking at the history of their um, town, uh, their village, but in connection to its disused railway ticket, they still sit on a, a line that is now a... a uh, what do you call it? Footpath. Footpath, thank you. <laughs> um, but they're looking at their railway ticket office uh, primarily, but that's actually, since they started looking at that, we're sort of encouraging them to look beyond the, the ticket counter, as it were, and they're looking around. Um, and then a local history society, which is Wheat Hampstead, which is, um, they've taken um, 100 years of our high street, with local residents each sort of taking on one property and trying to research as much as they can about that that one building and the people who lived in there. All of these things have a, long, a strong element of oral history in them, um, but also there is some archival research as well. And, and these and many other initiatives are run by voluntary organisations, heritage professionals and ad hoc groups brought together by fleeting or accidental interests, or by communities committed to a shared belief, practice or identity. And for some of these, we're a sounding board, just a way of testing the waters on what, what might be achievable. For others, we're a signpost to new sources and new questions. And in some cases, we've become full partners in exploring a theme or a story. Whatever their circumstances, Hertfordshire Heritage Project shares characteristics with ventures across the region and beyond. And most people here will recognise these features and how they've come to constitute the terms in which the field of public history is often discussed. So we have stories or orientations of place, discoveries of what it means to belong, emotional travels in time, collections, adoptions even of lost voices, both the expected and the unfamiliar, the power of memory, residence or expertise, which explorations of the past can consolidate and legitimate, so that the very process of historical engagement influences present day relationships. And I have to say that this is a phenomenon that is not always experienced positively by everybody in these groups. One person's belonging can take the form of another person's exclusion. Research generates exhilaration, passions and frustrations. Successful detective work and group sociability or missing records, participants lost to other activities, disagreements, even conflicts. We've seen elaborate plans to capture memories on film fail as people refuse to be interviewed. Strong commitments to social inclusion do not always create dialogue. So there are issues around managing material and expectations, seeing the bigger picture and living with gaps are not always straightforward. Academic historians can make a virtue out of silence 
or of memories that stubbornly refuse to conform to other narratives. But community researchers are less entranced by these possibilities if they are driven by a desire to preserve and catalogue memorabilia as their act of standing within or making history. We do well to remember that love of history that so many of those who are members of local history or community groups choose to emphasise in conversations with us as a way of claiming some right to tell their local story. This love of history is reflected in the large number of local groups which exist in our not very large county. At the last count, we were in contact with around 32 local history societies. And sometimes they're just a few people meeting to tell stories of how it used to be. Sometimes it's a more ambitious group who want to engage in what has been described to me as proper research. These people give their time, energy and often their money to deliver something which they want taken seriously. What they mean by love of history is hard to pin down for them as well as us. But in looking at the demographics, we can see that in the groups we know best, the majority of those who attend meetings are in the 60 plus age bracket. Many groups get large audiences for their lecture series, but a common pattern emerges of a much smaller number of members actively pursuing their research, with others expressing interest, but reluctant to engage, sometimes because that's just not what they signed up to, but sometimes due to problems with both the physical and financial aspects of travel and research, for example, photocopying, lack of confidence on computers, fear of the rules around record offices, just trying to get to record offices. Um, our plan at UH is to support both groups and encourage, sorry, our plan at UH is to support both groups and encourage where we can, dispelling the idea that research is only for the trained historian and showing how the beauty of collaborative history is that everybody can contribute something which builds into a bigger picture. So, to the issues. Um, yeah, I'll... Shall I just sketch that? There are just four issues. Shall I just sketch them quickly? Because I realise now we've spoken a bit longer than we thought we were going to. Um, and then we'd be interested to hear what people, people might want to discuss those, or if nobody's got anything to say, um, we can expand on them. Um, so the first issue we identified is a technical issue, and that was really um, Julie. Um, indicated it when she was talking about the website and this is actually trying to mesh university policy um, with what we wanted to do with community interaction and we had a lot of problems um, setting up our website partly because there was this tension between the sort of university sort of branding and corporate rules around websites and what we wanted to do which was sort of create a sort of grassroots roots place and we're st that's still that's still a work in progress we ha we still don't have we still don't have control yet, direct control of, of the website. We, that's coming, but not yet. Um, so those different environments, actually we saw that really writ large in terms of the discussions around the website. The second issue that um, we've been t turning over in our heads is ensuring that this is a symbiotic relationship and not a parasitic one. And here I'm thinking of the university being the parasite um, as the dominant institution. And I think this was the reason why we were particularly excited when people started to contact us, us on spec and by the links that our activities facilitated, which we only found out about later. For us, that, that was why we were so cheered by that, because it, it, we were what we were trying to do was sort of level out some of those, those great discrepancies in terms of resources and institutions. Third issue has been very thorny and has been hinted at earlier on today, and that is the issue about ownership. Who owns, who owns things? And that's sometimes what groups have tensions around, is about issues around ownership and control of what the material is or what the story is. Third, fourth thing to say is connected communities funding enabled us to alert learn a huge amount very quickly about how community groups worked. It's been absolutely fantastic for us. We discovered that actually what the groups wanted from us wasn't anything that we might call expertise. What they actually wanted from us often was um, confidence building, project management, for work, you know, running workshops, things like that. Those often turn out to be the most important things for them. And, the f and finally, the oh, which is uh, following from that, which also then raises issues about how do you go on get, fund these things on an ongoing basis. So Connected Communities allows us to do it for a couple of years. What do you do afterwards? And we were made painfully aware of that when one of the groups we're working with came back from a, a 
um, sort of connected communities, all our stories related workshop and blogged about it and said on it, um, I went thinking we had a really good relationship with our university, but when I listened to everybody else at the workshop, I started to get suspicious and thought, what does the university want from us? Why are they doing this? Are they going to drop us when the funding ends? And then thankfully she said, but I do think it's actually going to be all right. And we, that, that was a real eye-opener to us about how very delicate these relationships are. And that's why, in a sense, the hub is so important to us. That's why we're talking about that today, because that is, in a sense, the way, the, the, the way we're, going to try and, we're trying to address that, that issue. And finally, the other thing is that Julie and I have learned a lot over the last few years. Um, and a lot, of it, a lot of it is these personal relationships. And that means that it's with us, and it's not sort of it's not a set of resources that is immediately transferable out. So we've, it's also about finding mechanisms to share the experience and the sort of um, the tips almost, the tips about what's worked and what's not worked, that, so other people don't have to start at the beginning again and find out what we've found out and that we also can learn from what they've experienced rather than, again, us doing it by trial and error. So I don't know if any of that resonates with people in the room, but we'd be very interested to hear from you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>